Okay, it's Sunday afternoon. That means it is Wharf Poe's story time. And on Wharf Poe's story time, anything could be read. Usually read science fiction or my stuff and stuff, but I'm going to get all literary, esoteric, academic literary today. Or just some uh, good literature. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with some poems by Jack Gilbert. The other night on Helena Phoenix's show, she was having people come on, reading their poetry. She read some of her poetry. Uh, I got on, but I had no voice. My throat was sore. And, uh, you know, we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, Shining Your Demons or Dancing With Your Demons or whatever that show was that Rob did it on these Sundays anymore where he read poetry. So I'm going to read some poems by this great poet named Jack Gilbert, who was edited by Gordon Lish in the 70s and 80s, and then uh, some stuff from Gordon Lish himself, infamous for having been Raymond Carver's editor and slicing his stuff down, and then a story by William T. Volman called The Best Way to Smoke Crack. And if I have any other time left, maybe a Harlan Olsen story. I'm not sure uh, how long all this is going to take. So Jack Gilbert, interesting guy. He's still alive, but really old. He was a Yale series younger poet winner, I believe in the 50s. Uh, became a sort of famous poet, uh, but didn't like the limelight. Uh, throughout you know, his whole life, uh, you know, career that goes from the 50s till onwards. He's only published a handful of books and has somehow existed by becoming a sort of a patron or a, a sort of mascot for patrons. He, he just would bounce around Europe from one wealthy person or count or uh, uh, countess and all these uh, European royalty and, and uh, rich people who like to have a poet living with them. And that's how he existed. Uh, never really had a home. And of course you don't really, unless you're like Charles Bukowski or something, you don't really make a living on poetry. But he, he wrote some great poems. One of his most well-known books is called The Great Fires, which uh, Gordon Lish edited and came out from Knopf in 1994. Uh, he's like the only poet who had been published in Esquire magazine when uh, Gordon Lish ran Esquire magazine, which was, you know, if you know Esquire magazine, that was kind of strange for them. So I'm going to read some stuff from The Great Fires. And you tell me if you think he's a pretty damn fine poet or not. So starting, I'm just going to read some of the first few poems in the book. The first one is called Going Wrong. The fish are dreadful. They are brought up, the mountains in the dawn most days, beautiful and alien and cold from the night under the sea, the grand rooms fading from their flat eyes, soft machinery of the dark, the man thinks, washing them. What can you know of my machinery, demands the Lord. Sure, the man says quietly and cuts into them, laying back the dozen struts, getting the muck of something terrible. The Lord insists, you are the one who chooses to live this way. I built cities where things are human. I make Tuscany and you go to live with rocks and silence. The man washes away the blood and arranges the fish on a big plate starts the onions in the hot olive oil and puts in peppers. You have lived all year without women. He takes out everything and puts in fish. No one knows where you are. People forget you. You are vain and stubborn. The man slices tomatoes and lemons, takes out the fish and scrambled eggs. I am not stubborn, he thinks, laying all of it on the table in the courtyard full of early sun shadows of swallows flying on the food. Not stubborn, just greedy. The next poem is called Guilty. The man certainly looked guilty. 
ugly, ragged, and not clean, not to mention their finding him there in the woods with her body. Neighbors told how he was always playing with dead squirrels, mangled dogs, even snakes. He said there were only things that would allow him to get close. Look at me, the old man said with uncomplaining simplicity. I'm already one of the dead among the dead. It's hard to watch things humiliate, humiliated the way death does it. Possums smeared on the road, birds with ants eating out their eyes. Even dying rats want privacy for their disgrace. It's true I washed the dirt from her face and the blood off the body, combed her hair. I slept beside her, at her feet for two days, the way my dog used to. I got the dress on her the best I could. She looked so neglected, like garbage thrown in the weeds, like nobody cared because he had done that to her. I kept thinking about how long she is going to be alone now. I knew the police would take pictures and put them in the papers, naked and open, so people eating breakfast could look at her. I wanted to give her spirit enough time to get ready. And that's that poem, called Guilty. The next poem is called The Forgotten Dialect of the Heart. The Forgotten Dialect of the Heart. How astonishing it is that language can almost mean, and frightening that it does not quite. Love we say, God we say, Rome and Machico we write, and the words get it wrong. We say bread, and it means according to which nation. French has no word for home, and we have no word for strict pleasure. A people in northern India is dying out because their ancient tongue has no words for endearment. I dream of lost vocabularies that might express some of what we no longer can. Maybe the Etruscan texts would finally explain why the couples in their tombs are smiling, and maybe not, when the thousands of mysterious Sumerian tablets are translated they seem to be business records, but what if they are poems or psalms? My joy is the same as twelve Ethiopian goats standing silent in the morning light. O oh Lord, thou art slabs of salt and ingots and of copper, as grand as ripe heart barley life under the wind's labor. Her breasts are six white oxen loaded with bolts of long-fibred Egyptian cotton. My love is a hundred pitchers of honey. Shiploads of thaya are what my body wants to say to your body. Giraffes are this desire in the dark. Perhaps the spiral Minoan script is not a language but a map. What we feel most has no name but amber, arches, cinnamon, horses, and birds. The next poem is called Lovers. When I hear men boast about how passionate they are, I think of the two cleaning ladies at a second story window watching a man coming back from a party where there was lots of free beer. He runs in and out of buildings looking for a toilet. My lord, the tall woman says, that fellow down there surely does love architecture. The next poem is called Measuring the Tiger. Barrels of chains, sides of beef stacked in vans, water buffalo dragging logs of teak in the river mud outside Mandalay. Panticoter in the Byzantine dome, the mammoth overhead, crane bringing slabs of steel through the dingy light and roar to the giant shear that cuts the adamantine three-quarter inch plates and they flap down. The weight of the mine fractures the garden and the piers of, a sp of, of the spirit spilling out the heart's melt incandescent ingots big as cars 
trundling out of the titanic mills, red slags scaling off the brighter metal in the dark. The Mongolia River below, night's sheen on the belly, silent except for the machinery clinging deeper in us. You will love again, people say. Give it time. Me with time running out, day after day, of the everyday. What they call real life, made of eighth-inch gauze, newness, strutting around as if it were significant, irony, neatness, and rhyme, pretending to be poetry. I want to go back to that time after Michiko's death, when I cried every day among the trees, to the real, to the magnitude of pain, of being that much alive. He mentions someone named Michiko a lot in these poems from this book, which was his uh, his wife in Japan, Michiko, who uh, died of cancer. So in this book, The Great Fires, he has many poems about her. The next poem is called Voices Inside and Out, and is dedicated to Hayden Carruth, a well-known sort of academic poet. Voices Inside and Out. When I was a child, there was an old man with a ruined horse who drove his wagon through the back streets of our neighborhood crying iron iron meaning he would buy bed springs and dead stoves meaning for me in the years since the mines steel and the riveted gardens of the soul when i lived on ile saint louis a, gaze, a glazier came every morning crying vitre vitre meaning the glass on his back, but sounding like the swallows swooping years later at evening outside my high windows in Perugia. In my boyhood summers, Italian men came walking ahead of the track, calling out the ripeness of their melons, and old Jews slogged in the snow, crying, Brooms! Brooms! Two hundred years ago, the London shop boys yelled at people going by, what do you think of Jack? A terrible question to hear every day. Less and less, I think. The Brazilians say, in this country we have everything we need, except what we don't have. The next poem is called Tear It Down. We find out the heart only by demanding what the heart knows. By redefining the morning we find a morning that comes just after darkness. We can break through marriage into marriage. By insisting on love, we spoil it, get beyond affection, and wade mouth deep into love. We must unlearn the constellation to see the stars. But going back to our childhood would not help. The village is not better than Pittsburgh. Only Pittsburgh is more than Pittsburgh. Rome is better than Rome in the same way the sound of raccoon tongues licking the inside walls of the garbage tub is more than the stir of them in the muck of the garbage. Love is not enough. We die and are put into the earth forever. We should insist while there is still time. We must eat through the wildness of her sweet body already in our bed to reach the body within that body. The next poem is called Dante Dancing. 1. When he dances of meeting Beatrice that first time, he is a youth. His body has no real language, and his heart understands nothing of what has start started. Love like a summer rain after drought, like the thin cry of red-tailed hawk, like an angel sinking its teeth into our throat. He has only beginner steps to tell of the sheen inside him. The boy Dante sees her first with the absolute love possible only when we are ignorant of each other. Arm across his face, he runs off. Years go by. 2. The next dance is about their meeting again. He does an enchantment around her. Beatrice's heavy hair is dark and long. She watches with the Achi Dolce. He jumps. His jumps are a man's jumps. His steps have become the moves of a dancer who understands the dance. 
a man who recognizes the body's greed. She is deep in her body's heart. He is splendid. She is lost and is led away by the ant. Her family is careful after that. She goes by in a carriage. He rises on his toes, port de bras, his eyes desperate. Then she is at an upstairs window of the palace. He dances his sadness brilliantly in the moonlight below on the empty pla piazza, concentrating. She moves the curtain a little to the side, and he is happy. It is a dream we all know, the perfection of love that is not real. There is a fountain behind him. 3. In the few years later, they are finally in his simple room. His long dance of afterward is a declaration of joy and gratitude and devotion. She dances strangely, putting on her clothes, a delicate goodbye. Her soul is free now from that kind of love. He stands motionless, bewildered, watching her go, then dances his grief wonderfully. 4. When we see Dante as an old man, he is a dancer who can manage only the simple steps of the beginning. He dances the romance lost, the love that never was, and the great love missed because of dreaming. First position, entrante, and the smallest jumps, the passionate quiet, the quieter and strongest, the special sorrow of a happy and perfect heart that finally knows well how to dance, but does not. And that poem was Dante Dancing. And this poem, The Great Fires, the title poem of the book, The Great Fires. Love is apart from all things. Desire and excitement are nothing beside it. It is not the body that finds love. What leads us there is the body. What is not love provokes it. What is not love quenches it. Love lays hold of everything we know. The passions which are called love also change everything to a newness at first. Passion is clearly the path but does not bring us to love. It opens the castle of our spirit so that we might find the love which is a mystery hidden there. Love is one of many great fires. Passion is a fire made of many word, woods, each of which gives off a special odor so that we can know the many kinds that are not love. Passion is the paper and twigs that kindle the flames but cannot sustain them. Desire perishes because it tries to be love. Love is eaten away by appetite. Love does not last, but it is different from the passion that do not last. Love lasts by not lasting. Isaiah said each man walks in his own fire for his sins. Love allows us to walk in the sweet music of our particular heart. That was the great fires. The next one is called Finding Something. I say moon is horses in the temporal dark because horse is the closest I can get to it. I sit on the terrace of this worn villa the king's telegraphic telegrapher built on the mountains that looks down on the blue sea and the small white ferry that crosses slowly to the next island each noon. Michiko is dying in the house behind me. The long windows open so I could hear the faint sound she will make when she wants watermelon to suck on so I could take her to a bucket in the corner of the high ceiling room which is the best we can do for a chamber pot. She will lean against my leg as she sits so not to fall over in her weakness. How strange and fine to get so near to it. The arches of her feet are like voices of children calling in the grove of lemon trees where my heart is as helpless as crushed birds. All right, well, I'll just, I'll stop there. Uh, gives you an idea of the work of Jack Gilbert. Uh, 
great poet, I believe. And and the work always sounds differently or has opens different avenues to the reader when read aloud as opposed to reading it quietly in your mind as with the book as, as you uh, voice it verbally it um it uh i don't know it's, it, there's something different about it and it, and that holds true for the writings of gordon lish m more known as an editor than a writer famous editor from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, turned Esquire magazine around quite a bit in the 60s and 70s, no, in the 70s, as uh, uh, much more of a, a literary journal that was a literary magazine uh, as opposed to a fashion men's magazine the way it was in, say, the uh, 1920s and 30s when they used to publish like Hemingway and Fitzgerald and all that. then he went on to be a book editor most famous for discovering Raymond Carver uh, Don DeLillo Barry Hanna and other writers um, so his own work tend to be more like uh, monologue pieces that are best heard out loud than, than, uh, than as written text on a page hopefully that, that'll come out as I read them of course no one can read them like himself I mean, Gordon used to give, uh, I, I was a student of his in the late 80s in New York, uh, took his private classes, which were infamous, um, but when he gave lectures, uh, he could just talk on and on for hours. I mean, his private classes were often like a six-hour lecture, uh, often just a um, stream of consciousness. He has one novella out called My Romance, which just, which just is, a, a, is simply a transcript of him doing a sort of stream of consciousness uh, monologue about a watch that used to belong to his father. A lot of his writing has to do with family. Um, and of course the writers he liked to publish and edit often wrote about family. So Gordon Lish, I'm going to be reading from his book called Mourner at the Door, a collection of call them short stories or monologues or rants and diatribes or, or, or text. I guess the best way is just to call them text. Um, not, not exactly fiction or, or stories, but uh, language text. Uh, he's been compared to Samuel Beckett and um, Gertrude Stein, if any of you out there know uh, the writing of, of those two. So the first piece here from uh, Mourner at the Door is called The Death of Me. The Death of Me. I wanted to be amazing. I wanted to be so amazing. I had already been amazing up to a certain point. But I was tired of being at that point. I wanted to go past that point. I wanted to be more amazing than I had been up to that point. I wanted to do something which went beyond that point and which went beyond every other point and which people would look at and say that was something which went beyond all other points and which no other boy would ever be able to go beyond that I was the only boy who could that I was the only one I was going to a day camp which we called the Pen Peninsula Athletes Day camp and which at the end of the summer had all campers, all parents, all sports field day which was made up of five different field events and all the campers had to take part in all five of the five different field events and I was the winner in all five of the five different field events I was the winner in every single field event I came in the first place in every one of the five different field events so that the head of the camp and the camp counselors and the other campers and the other mothers and the other fathers and my mother and my father all saw that I was the best camper in the Peninsula Athletes Day Camp the best in the short run and the best in the long run and the best in the high jump and the best in the broad jump and the best in the event which was which the Peninsula Athletes Day Camp called the ball throw which was where you had to go up to the chalk line and then put your toe in the chalk line 
and not go over the chalk line and then go ahead and throw the ball as far as you could throw. I did. I won. It was 1944 and I was 10 years old and I was better than all the other boys at the camp and probably all the boys at any other camp and all the boys everywhere else. I felt more wonderful than I had ever felt. I felt so thrilled with myself. I felt like God was whispering things to me made inside my he head to me. I felt like God was asking me, for me, to have a special secret within him, and for, or for me to have a secret arrangement with him, and that I had better keep on listening to his secret recommendations to me inside of my head. I felt like God was telling me to realize that he had made me the most unusual member of the human race, and that he was going to need for me to be ready for, for him, for me to go to work for him at any minute for him on whatever thing he said. They gave me a piece of stuffed cloth, which was the shape of a shield, and which had the camp colors, and which had five blue stars on it. They said that I was the only boy ever to get a shield with as many and as that many stars on it. They said that it was unheard of for any boy ever to get as many as that many stars on it. But I could already feel that I was forgetting what it felt like for somebody to do something which could get you a shield with as many as that many stars on it. I could feel myself forgetting, and I could feel everything else forgetting, even my mother and father, and God forgetting. It was just a little while afterwards, but I could tell that everybody was already forgetting everything about it, that the head of the camp was, and that the camp counselors were, and that the other campers were, and that the other mothers and the other fathers were, and that my mother and my father were, and that even that I myself was, even though I was trying with all of my might for me to be the one person who never would. I felt like God was ashamed of me. I felt like God was sorry that I was the one which he had picked out, and that he was getting ready for him to make a new choice, for him to choose another boy instead of me, and that I was to hurry up before God did it that I had to be quick about showing God that I could be just as amazing again as I used to be, and that I could do something, do anything else. It was August. I was feeling the strangest feeling that I ever felt. I was standing there with my parents, and with all of the people who had come there for the field day, and I was feeling the strangest feeling which I had ever felt. I felt like lying down on the field. I felt like killing all the people. I felt like going to sleep and staying asleep until someone came and told me that my parents were dead and that I was all grown up and that there was new, a new God in heaven and that he liked me better than even the old God had. My parents kept asking me where did I want to go now and what did I want to do. My parents kept trying to get me to tell them where I thought we should all of us go now and what the next thing for us to do as in a family should do. My parents kept saying they want, wanted for me to be the one to make up my mind if we should all of us go someplace special now and what was the best thing for the family as a family to do. But I did not know what they meant. Do? 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 My father took the shield away from me and held it in his hands and kept turning it over in his hands and kept looking at the shield in his hands and kept feeling the shield with his hands and kept saying that it was made of buckram and of felt. My father kept saying, did we know that it was just something which they had put together out of buckram and of felt? My father kept saying that the shield was of a very nice quality of buckram and of felt but that we should make every effort for us not to get it wet because it would run all over itself, Buckman and Felt, Buckram and Felt. I did not know what to do. I could tell my parents did not know what to do. We just stood around with the people all around, all going away to all of the vehicles that were going to take them to places, and I could tell that we did not, as a family, know if it was time for us to go. 
the head of the camp came over and said that he wanted to shake my hand against again and to shake my hand shake the hands of other people who were responsible for giving the peninsula athletes day camp such an outstanding young individual and such a talented young athlete as my mother and father had he shook my hand again it made me feel dizzy and nearly asleep i saw my mother and my father get their hands ready i saw my father get the shield out of his out of the hand that he thought he was going to need for him to have his hand ready to shake the hand of the head of the camp. I saw my mother take her purse and do the same thing, but the hand of the camp just sh kept shaking my hand, and my mother and my father just kept saying thank you to him, and then the head of the camp let go of my hand and took my father's elbow with one hand and then touched my father on the shoulder with the other hand and then said that we were certainly the very finest of people and then he did this he did this and then he went away okay that was the death of me because you could see uh, Gordon Lish's writing as uh, repetitive um, almost schizophrenic I would say but uh, repetitive in the same way that Samuel Beckett and Gertrude Stein wrote which is why he's been compared to them Okay, the next story is called Mr. Goldbaum. Mr. Goldbaum. Picture Florida. Picture Miami Beach, Florida. Picture a crappy little apartment in a big crappy building where my mother, who is a person who is old, is going to have to go ahead and start getting used to her not being in the company of her husband anymore, not to mention not anymore being in that of anybody else who is her own flesh and blood anymore. The instant I and my sister can devise good enough alibis for us to hurry up and get the hell out of here and go fly back up to the lives that we have been prosecuting for ourselves up in New York, that of course being before we were obliged to drop everything and get down here yesterday in time to ride along with the old woman in the limo which has been set up for her to take her to my dad's funeral. It took her. It took us and her, meaning me and my sister with her. Then it took us right back to where we have been sitting ever since we came back to sit ourselves down and wait for neighbors to come call. I am checking my watch about nine billion minutes ago. Picture nine minutes in this room. Or just smell it. Smell the room. Picture the smell of where they lived, where it was, the both of them that lived. And then go ahead and picture her her smelling to see if she could smell him in it anymore. I am going to give you the picture of how they walked, always together, never one without the other, her always the one in front, him always shuffling along behind, him with the hands always on her shoulders, him always with his hands reaching up out of my mother like that, with his hands up on her shoulders like that, her always looking to me like she was walking him the way you would look if you were walking an imbecile, as if there was something wrong with the man, wrong with the way that the man was, but there was nothing wrong with him, with my father, the way he was. My father just liked to walk like that whenever my father was walking with my mother, and my father never went walking without my mother. I mean, this is what they did. This is how they did it. When I saw them. This is what I saw when I saw my parents get old whenever I went down to Florida and had to see my old parents walk. Try picturing more minutes. I think I must have told you that we made it on time. Only it was, was not anything like with what I had been picturing 
when I had myself down on the airplane and started keeping myself busy picturing the kind of funeral I was going to be seeing when I got to Florida for the funeral my father was going to have. Picture this. It was just a rabbi that they had gone ahead and hired. To my mind, the man was too young-looking and too good-looking. I kept thinking the man probably had me beat in both departments. I kept thinking how much the man was getting paid for this, and would it come to more, or would it come to less than my ticket down and my ticket back? I felt bigger than I had ever felt. I did not know where the ashes were. I did not know how the burning was done. There were some things which I knew I did not know, but I know that I still felt bigger than I had ever felt. As for him, the rabbi took a position on one side of the room. The rabbi stood himself up on one side of the room, and me and my sister and my mother, we all went over to where we could tell we were supposed to go over to and the other side of the room, some of the time sitting and some of the other time standing, but I cannot tell you how it was that we ever knew which one it was and right for us to do. I heard, Father of Life, Father of Death. I heard the rabbi say, Father of Life, Father of Death. Father of Life, Father of Death. I heard the guy who was driving the limo say, Get your mother's feet. Picture us back in the limo again. Picture us stopping off at a delicatessen. Picture me and my mother sitting and waiting while my sister gets out and gets in to make sure that they are going to send over exactly what it was we had ordered when she called up and called our orders in. Maybe it would help for you to picture things if I told you that my mother has on her head is a wig of plastic hair that fits down almost all over her ears. It smells in here. I could smell the smell of them in here and of every single one of the sandwiches that just came over from the delicatessen in here. Now picture it like this. The stuff came hours ago and so far is all that has come. I mean the questions is this. Where are all the neighbors which this death was supposed to have been ordered for? I just suddenly realized that you might be interested in finding out what we, f we, what we finally decided on. The answer is four corned beef on rye, four turkey on rye, three Car Jarlsberg and lettuce on whole wheat, and two low-salt tuna salad on a bagel. Now double it because we are figuring strictly a half sandwich apiece. Here is some more lo local color. The quiz programs are going off and the soap operas are coming on and my sister just got up and went to go lie down on my mother's bed and I could tell you that I would go and do the same if I was absolutely positive that it would not be against my religion for me to do it because who knows what it could be against for you to go lie down on your father's bed. It could be some kind of curse on you that for the rest of your life it would keep coming after you until, ha <laughs> ha, just like him, that's it, you're dead. My mother says to me, so tell me, Sonny, you think we got reason to be nervous about the coffee? My mother says to me, so what do you think, Sonny? You think I should go make some extra coffee? My mother says to me, I want for you to be honest with me, sweetheart. You think we are asking too big of a chance? The coffee might not be more than plenty of enough coffee? My mother says to me, so what is it that, what is it that's your opinion, darling? Is it your opinion that we could probably get away with it if your mother does not go past another pot of coffee? Nobody could have pictured that nor have listened to no one calling us and no one imploring us f to hold everything for us to keep the coffee hot that they are right this minute racing up the elevators and racing down stairways and rushing along corridors and will be any second knocking on the door because there is a new widow in the building and an old man just plotted 
you know what? I do not think that you are going to have to picture anything along the lines of that, except for maybe Mr. Goldbaum. Here is Mr. Goldbaum. Mr. Goldbaum is the man who sticks his head in at the door which we left open for the company which was on the way over. Here's Mr. Goldbaum talking. You got an assortment, or is it all fish? That was Mr. Goldbaum. My mother says, that was Mr. Goldbaum. My mother says, the Mr. Goldbaum from the building. Now, you could picture a whole different thing, a whole different place. This name, it's in the Sunday afterwards. So picture this time this, my sister and me, the Sunday afterwards. Picture the two different cars we rented to get out of the city to Long Island to the cemetery. Picture the cars parked on different sides of the administrative building, which we are supposed to meet uh, at for us to meet up with the rabbi who has been hired to say a service over the box which I am carrying of ashes. Picture someone carrying the ashes. Now because I am the son, not because I am the son, because the box is made out of something too heavy. Now here is a picture you've had practice with. Me and my sister waiting. Picture my sister and me standing around where the offices are, the people who run the cemetery, which is a cemetery way out on Long Island in February. I just suddenly had another thought, which I just realized. What if your father was the kind of father who was dying and he called you to him and he said you were his son and he said for you to come lie down on the bed with him so that he as your father could hold you and so that you as his son could hold him and so that the both of you could both be like that hugging with each other like that for to say goodbye to each other because you had to go actually go leave each other and you did it you did it you got down on the bed with your father and you got down up close to your father and you got your arms all around your father and your father was hugging you and you were hugging your father and there was one of you who could not stop it who could not help it but who just got or both did picture that not not that I am my father hugged ever like that. Here comes the next rabbi. The rabbi is not such a young looking rabbi. Is not such a good looking rabbi. Is a rabbi who just looks like a rabbi who is cold from just coming in like a rabbi from outside with the weather. The rabbi says to my sister, you are the daughter of the departed. The rabbi says to me, you are the son of the departed. The rabbi says to the box, These are the mortal remains of the individual, which is the deceased party. Maybe I should get you a picture of the cemetery, because this is the cemetery where all of us are going to be buried in. Wherever we die, even if it is in Florida, I mean our plots here, my family's is. The rabbi says to me, As we make our way to the gravesite, I trust that you will want to offer me a word or two about your father, so that I might incorporate whatever ideas and thoughts you have into the service your mother called up and ordered. May God give this woman peace. Okay, picture him and me and my sister all going back inside in February again, and all again in February again, and I am the only one who cannot get his gloves back on because of the box, because of the canister, because of the goddamn urn which is too heavy for me to handle without holding on to it every single instant with both of my hands. The hole, the hole I am going to have to help you with, the hole they dug up for my father, is not what I would have ever been able to picture in my mind if somebody came up to me and said to me, and for me to do my best to picture the hole they make for you when you get your father's grave. I mean, the hole was more like a hole which you would go dig for somebody if the job they had for you to do was to cover up a big covered dish, like for a casserole. And that is not the half of it, because what makes it the half of it is the two cinder blocks, which I could see already down when I get go to put the urn down into the hole. And for what other half? 
this is the two workmen who come over from somewhere I was already was for somebody to come over from and who put down two more cinder blocks on top of what I just put in. You know what I mean when I say cinder blocks? I mean they those gray blocks of gray cement or the gray concrete that when they refer to them they call them cinder bricks or cinder blocks and they've got holes for them. Four of those. Whereas what I had always thought was that what they did with the grave was fill things back in it with what they took out, unless they had taken out cinder blocks. You can go ahead and relax now. It is not necessary for you to lend yourself to any further effort to create particularities that I myself was not competent to render, except it would be a tremendous help for me if you would do your best to listen to the different sets of bumps the different sets of tires make when all three of us pass over a little speed bump that makes everybody go slow before coming onto and going out of the cemetery my family is in three cars six sets of tires that's six bumps i count six bumps and a total of twenty six half sandwiches six sounds of hand cold rubber in February of 1986. Or hear this, the rabbi's hands as he rubs the wheel to warm the wheel where he has come to have the habit of keeping his grip in place on the wheel when to, to steer, to steer, the rabbi puts his hands on the wheel and thinks, Jesus that, that's it, I'm finished except to inform you of the fact that I got back to the city not via the Queen's Midtown Tunnel but via the Queensboro Bridge since with that bridge you beat the toll that and the fact that I went right ahead and sat myself down and started trying to picture some of the things which I have just asked for you to picture for me and that and the fact that I had to fill in for myself where the holes were sometimes too big for anybody to get a good enough picture of them. The point being to get something written. The point being to get anything written and then get paid for it. To get paid for, for it as much as I could get paid for it. This is to cover the cost of the Delta down to the and the Delta back. Avis at their Sunday rate plus extra for liability and collision. Oh, one last thing, which is that no one has told me. So I just took it for granted that where it was supposed to go was to go down in between them. And that was Mr. Goldbaum. Curious little monologue. jump to still reading from Mourner at the door um, I'm trying to find the one I'm going to read so as I was saying uh, Gordon Lish uh, Texts are are repetitive and uh, almost as if you're like listening to the thoughts of someone. Um, if you even listen to your own thoughts, sometimes uh, sometimes they go like that. You know, you kind of repeat sentences and uh, all that. Okay, the third and last one from this book. So I just wanted to read something different than the usual science fiction. Uh, this one's called The Wire. The Wire by Gordon Lish. My wife says, look at you. Just look at you. How can you look like that? Why don't you take a good look at yourself? Look at me. Don't you have any idea of what you look like? What do you think people are going to think when they look at you? Tell me, how can you go around looking like that? Do you know what you look like? You couldn't conceivably know what you look like. 
What, who would believe anyone could look like that? I cannot believe what you look like. It is hard for me to grasp it. A man who could go around looking like you look like that. What is the matter with you? Don't you know what you look like? You probably don't have the first idea what you look like. You act like you are completely oblivious to what you look like. Don't you realize people are looking at you? Have you no conception of the fact that there are people who are looking at you? Why are you so utterly unaware of the fact that you cannot go around looking like whatever you happen to feel like looking like? Take a look at yourself. Go ahead and just take a good look at yourself. That is what my wife says. As for myself, I used to think it didn't put her in the best of lights for her to be going around being heard looking like somebody saying things like that. Years ago, there had been a fellow who kept trying to offer me some observations along the very same lines of the ones which my wife in her time did, but I didn't see any reason to argue with him either. So far as his story goes, he's dead as a doornail now, so let's just get his name and address right out here, right onto this sheet of paper here. Wardus, S. Bernard Wardus, his conduct of the business of psychiatry being carried out by him at one of the high even numbers on, you know, on East 57th Street. Here's an example of it. Just look at yourself. Don't you ever look at yourself? Why don't you come to your senses and sit yourself down and take a good look at yourself? But I've always been the sort of person to take a different view of looking. You take today on the subway, for instance, this woman with this hulkiness of a suitcase. Here is what my mother used to say to me. Do you see what you look like? I don't think you see what you look like. How can you let people see you looking like this? You want to go through life seeing yourself looking like this? Look, the man committed me and made sure I stayed right where he did, where he did it to me. And this was for just shy of twelve brazen months. I kept trying to see up inside her pants past where the crease was. I'm leaving out everything. I'm leaving out even the TNA of it. I am just too wary of it for me to ever go over the whole history of it in a sense of the whole anything of anything again. All right, shy of eight months, not shy of 12 months, but since when is time the point? He said to me, it's high time you took the time to sit yourself down and take a good, decent look at yourself. Here's what happened on the E-train today. The woman the color of what do they say there there is a woman the color of coffee with cream in it and she's got on um, short pants on her and for the top she's got on what I think they call a halter top and they're both they're both uh, tops and the bottoms they have that look the both of them that you would that you will sometimes see uh, they're being both at the same time just tight enough and just loose enough and she has got her hair moan all the way down to her skull to a wooly looking fuzzy high dome frizzle of a thing and there there her legs are oh there her legs are there her legs are they are uncovered and glowy right up to almost past her backside almost and crossed in that manner leg over leg of how only a woman who gets herself looked at like this ever crosses her legs over leg like that and the eyes and the arms and the mouth and that throat I mean the things of her the woman the things she had a small child up on one shoulder she was about 20 and it was I don't know maybe it was a baby there wasn't any ring on any of her fingers the child the baby it was out like a light in any light and I could tell the mother was almost also oh well yes I could see the slenderness of gold ones like a wire but it wasn't on any of her fingers my sister used to say to me I don't think you ever stop to think about what you look like the building I live in now hey it's so full of psychologists and psychiatrists and psychoanalysts and psychotherapists it isn't even funny this whole block is they know 
who Wardus is here, or who Wardus was, his fame went all the way up from 57th Street, or, if the rhyme's all the same to you, came up because here is where I live, up here now. The suitcase, just to look at it, you could just look at it and tell it weighed a ton. The first girl I ever tried to do it, she did it, but she didn't look in any like anything and neither have any of the others of them of all the millions of times since. Hundreds. Thousands. <sighs> but what about the girl on the E-train today when I was going for the D at 7th? Look, you've got a perfect right to know why the ma'am committed me. But tell me something. Tell me. Can't you already tell for yourself? I thought someone's dumped her. She's got no one. God has sent me as my deliverance, this deliverance. The second girl I ever did it with was probably less good to look at than the first one was, right then and there, who couldn't have taken one look and doped it all out. The hopeless oblata of desire. The last one said, Okay, but do you think you are getting away with fooling me with what you look like, Buster, not even for one stinking minute? I thought, wouldn't it be proof of heaven's handiwork if she gets out at seven to also change over to the D-train? He said it with the accent on the nard, dead at 43, heart. Heaven was taking a hand in it all right, except only up to a point it was, because when she got to the door, struggling with it and with the baby, too piercingly, too pitiably, that it made you want to kill her for love. What she said to me was, no, when I said to her, you want for me to come to try to help you with it so you can get down the stairs? I'm not telling the whole story. Tomorrow is June 17th. That's a little more of the story. The rest of it is, well, she told me she wasn't going down to the stairs, and when I got down there and then looked back up at them, then there she was, coming down them, and then going right past me onto the platform, and then going all the way up from the end of the platform, as far away from me as she could get, all that cargo of her wretchedness notwithstanding. My wife says, who do you think you, you think is ever going to look at you looking like that? Hey, but guess whose sister the mother effer was humping when his ticker up and jumped him forty bucks into the one hundred dollar hour of friendly family psychotherapy? Yeah, but lately, lately, what I'd like to know is this. Who has the one validated desperation of my life ever been doing to the death for me? Hmm? Noves Verdad? Okay, that was called The Wire. Who knows what that story was about? But it sounds interesting when you read it out loud. So, go onward to something more narrative. To a story by William T. Wellman called The Best Way to Smoke Crack that I published in an anthology I edited called what the F, the Avant Porn Anthology. I also published it in the Expelled from Eden, which is a William T. Volman reader. I am the foremost William T. Volman scholar out there. I wrote the first critical book on him, which was published in 2009 uh, by McFarlane. And I also just recently, earlier this year, published a uh, a full bibliography on his work, which is about 120 pages long, from the academic publisher Scarecrow Press, and uh, written numerous essays about him. Finishing up an essay right now about him for a book of essays from the University of Delaware Press, and so on and so forth. In the 1990s, he was hanging out with crack prostitutes written a number of stories and essays about them, so one of the best is a story called The Best Way to Smoke Crack, 
So that's next. The Best Way to Smoke Crack by William T. Volman. San Francisco, California, 1992. Oh, I should note that this was also, he published this in his book, The Atlas. Okay, the best way to smoke crack. The crack pipe was a tube of glass half as thick as the finger, jaggedly broken at both ends because the prostitute had dropped it. She kept talking about the man down the hall, whose pipe still wore a bowl. She said that that special pipe was for sale, but the John figured that he had already spent enough. The John was of the all-night species, family bladite, having reached that age when a man's virility begins to wilt flabbily, he admitted that his lust for women grew yearly more slobbery and desperate. Every year now he felt a little further from what he had been. In his youth he had been considered himself to in his youth he had not considered himself to be anything special. Now he recollected with awe how his member had once leaped eagerly up to the merest thought of touch, how his orgasms had gushed as fluently as Abraham Lincoln's speeches. Those were the nights when ten minutes between the trash cans or beneath a parked car had sufficed. His joy now required patience and closeness. That was why he had paid the twenty-nine dollars to share with this woman whose brown body was as skinny as a grasshopper's, this stinking room whose carpet was scattered with crumbs of taco shells and rotting cheese. Among his possessions he now counted the sheet which someone had used to wipe diarrhea, the science fiction book called the metal smile, a gold mine of empty matchboxes, and all the wads of used toilet paper that anyone would ever need to start a new life. He had bought the room for the night, and after that he was going to go back to work, and the prostitute would live there. Maybe that was why she worked so hard at cleaning up, hanging the diarrhea sheet over the window for a curtain, picking up the hunks of spoiled food and throwing them out the window, sweeping with the broom without bristles, sprinkling the carpet with water from the sink, which had doubled as a urinal, so that the filth would stick better to the broom. Maybe that was why she cleaned, or maybe it was because she had once had a home where she raised her children as well as she could, until jail became her home, and although they took her children and turned them into somebody else's, or more likely nobody's, it was too late for her to shuck the habit of making her surroundings decent, or maybe she worked so hard just because she wanted him to be happy and comfortable with her. It wasn't for whatever left this mess. There'd be no roaches, she said. I've lived in this hotel all this time and never had roaches. He sat on the mattress with his arm around her while they smoked a rock, and the cockroach rushed across his leg. I'm not afraid of any human being, the prostitute said. I'm a single female out there, so I gotta be ferocious, so they can respect in me. They can be respect in me, and I'm not afraid of any animal. But insects give me the jitters, all them roaches in here. It's cause whoever was in here before was such a slob. If I ever meet that mother effer and he pass and he pisses me off, I'll say to him, You know what? You remind me of your room. Oh look at that big fat roach. Certainly the big fat roach was blameless for being what it was. And the prostitute was likewise likewise faultless for her not wanting that roach to crawl across them later that night once they turned out the bare bulb which reflected itself in the greasy window. Biting her lip with disgust, she slammed her shoe against the wall over until the bug was nothing but a stain among the stains. I really hate them roaches, she sighed, loading her blackened pipe with more whiteness. They just give me the creeps, you know, in the projects. You catch them with crack. If you cleaned up your place too good, and stuff, and you can't find them, you just lay a rock out on the table and they'll be swarming, man. There's there's another one. 
she snatched up her shoe and pounded the wall. She was picking up bits of rancid cheese out of the chest of drawers with three drawers gone while the john lay watching the roaches. They seemed to be accustomed to the light. They scurried up and down the walls on frantic errands, ran across the carpet whose water stains and burns resembled the abscesses of half Korean molly down the hall. Another prostitute said she kept picking at herself, and one roach even climbed that foul bed sheet draped over the window. The prostitute came back to the mattress, and they smoked another piece of rock. She loaned the pipe to a whore who had bought bad stuff, so it stank of something strange. Now she kept running water through it, but that didn't do any good. Nudge that rock down into the end that's burned blacker. The John knew that much. Don't push it in too hard, or you'll break the mesh, which is already almost gone. She had taught him that. Just tap it lovingly in with the black burned hairpin. Lovingly, I said, because crack is the only happiness. The prostitute celebrated whenever she got a big rock by buying a lighter whose color matched her dress. She held a red lighter tonight to keep her red dress company. She was wearing red shoes and a red headband. Red was her favorite shade. He had seen her in the black cocktail dress and she put on, that she put on when he knocked at her door and she was embarrassed because she thought she looked old. He didn't care how old or how young she looked because he loved her. But she closed the door and wouldn't let him in until she was beautiful for him in the black dress which 30 seconds later he was urgently helping her pull off and he had seen her in the foxtail outfit that reminded him of women he knew at the horse races but most often he had seen her wearing the hue of vibrant blood she lit the rock and breathed in even though the tube of glass had been broken so short that it burned her lips and tongue when the rock was only half cooked she breathed in because when she was 18, her first husband had brought a 2 by 4 smashed on the crown of her head, and after that, she had never had a very good balance. That was 20 years ago now, and one of her daughters, she'd been very little then, had said, Mama, don't ever worry about falling, because I'll always be next to you, and if I ever see you start going down, I'll throw myself right down on the sidewalk so you can fall on me. It made her cry sometimes to remember that. Her daughter didn't walk beside her anymore, and so she smoked crack. The John was looking worried. Crack isn't addictive now, is it? he said. Oh no, honey, the prostitute smiled. It's just a psychological thing. And later in the night, when she spread her legs for him and he worried about AIDS, she said to him, Oh, don't worry, honey. You can only get AIDS if you're two homosexuals. There were two roaches on the wall, and she got them, both with her shoe, in a slamming blow like the one three months ago when that had left her permanently blind in the right eye when she was being raped. Now she couldn't read a menu anymore. Inhale it slowly. Hold five or six seconds. Expel it through the nose. That was her way. That was the that way was more mellow. If you did it too fast, you might get tweaked. First the head rush, and then the body rush. Don't inhale so hard, she said. That's the difference between white boys and black boys. White boys always inhale too fast, cause they think if they do, they'll get more a uh, more high. You white boys are just greedy sometimes. Black boys know better. He felt the smoke in his chest as he held it in, and then the rush struck him behind his eyeballs. Now his heart began to pound more fiercely. His lips and tongue swelled into a numb, clean fatness. The feeling that he had was the same as long ago at the high school dances when the boys and girls had stood on opposite sides of the floor and the music had started but he was too afraid to cross the open space where all the girls could see him as he came among them 
to ask one to share her beauty with him for a dance, so his heart pounded faster and faster, until suddenly he was going to the girls anyway to say, Will you dance with me? And the girls giggled, and their friends giggled, and she looked quickly at her friends, and then at him, and said yes, and he was going into the music with her, holding her hand. It was exactly that way that his heart was pounding, except that there was no fear in this his excitement. This time, no matter how rapid his happiness became, it remained tranquil. Well, <laughs> laughed the prostitute, who always became more talkative the more crack she did. Another main difference between white people and black people is white people have reputations to protect when they buy drugs. Black people don't care. And she laughed. Ahead waited the long night of her going in and out to do her business, which she pretended not to be doing, believing that pretending would keep him from bleeding, feeling hurt, when actually he wasn't hurt at all. She was trying to be loving by protecting him from what she was doing, while he was trying to be loving by letting her do whatever she needed to do. Meanwhile, they both smoked crack. Ahead of that night loomed the night when he took her out for dinner with his friends, and she was late because she had to smoke crack. And then at dinner, she excused herself to go to the ladies' room where she smoked crack and came out weeping as though her heart would break because she was convinced that all his friends looked down on her. So he embraced her outside as she soaked him with tears, begging him to return her to that hotel on Mission Street, whose gratings and buzzers were like airlocks. So later that night, he did come to her, and when he lay beside her on the dirty mattress and took her into his arms, her face was burning hot, her forehead streamed with sweat and smelled like crack, the delicious, bitter, clean smell even more healthy and elegant than eucalyptus or swiss herbal lozenges she ground her face into his chest and whispered something about the bible as her sick and glowing face bursted its way into his heart there was a woman whom he loved who was a scientist when he told her what had happened the woman said that fever that night sweat that dementia about your friends well it sounds to me like aids particularly the very early stages. But another friend just rubbed his stubble and said, Ah, her sweat smelled like crack, huh? She must be ODing on crack. Happens all the time. Ahead of that night, crouched the night when the John woke up in his own bed, wanting crack. It was the middle of a moonless time. He had no crack. He said to himself, if only the moon was here, maybe that would cheer me up so I could sleep again. But, head, but ahead of that night laughed the night when he woke up from a dream of crack with the moon outside his window as big and round as the abscess on the prostitute's foot, which would not heal. And he lay wide awake, needing crack. They smoked crack, and he lay in her arms staring up at the long lateral groove lips of the molding reflected in the mirror of the medicine cabinet whose shelves had all been wrenched out and he began to smile look at that he cried look at all those roaches running crazy across the ceiling i guess they must really be enjoying themselves the woman cackled well, i suppose they'd be getting the contract high from the smoke up there but it kind of pisses me off because they can't pay me no money they both laughed at that, and then they did another piece of rock in the best way. She approved how he smoked crack now. The best way to smoke crack is to suck it from the tube of broken glass as gently as you'd suck crack smoke breath, the crack smoke breath from the lips of the prostitute who's kissing you. San Francisco, California. 
The John remembered the nights when he was still married and lay in the darkness of the guest bedroom watching Golden Hall light, listening to the rush of his wife's high heels as she adjusted her dress and necklace in the main bedroom, his grief and anxiety hideous while his heart ticked with the clock. He decided that if his wife asked him to come, he would say, Why should I? But then he thought that did not sound sincere and he was actually very sincere. So he decided that when his wife came in, he would just say, convince me and I'll go. His wife was almost ready now. It was cold and dark outside the window. He knew that he was missing his last hope by lying there with his wife, put the penultimate touches of lipstick on. He was terrified that his wife might, might not even come and look for him. If she did not at least ask him, he could not volunteer to go with her. She went into the bathroom, where she must be checking herself in the mirror. Now she came out and turned off the bathroom light. He resolved that if his wife was making the rounds of the upstairs, turning off lights, she paused. Perhaps she was wondering where he was. He could not move. He would not move. He heard her go downstairs. She was clicking her high heels rapidly through every darkened room, including the living room where the unlit Christmas tree slobbered its sticky shadow of shaggy foulness. She must be looking for him. She was back at the bottom of the stairs now, and he heard her picking up her keys. She was, So she was going to leave without calling for him. He lay breathless, with tension. She called his name. Here I am, he said. Where are you? It's all dark up there, she said. Here, he said, with effort. She came up the stairs and turned the hall light back on. He heard her going into each of the other room again. At last she entered the half-ajar door of the guest bedroom and stood peering to see if he was there. He could not say anything. Are you sleeping, she said hesitantly. No, he said. She turned on the light and looked at him. I'm going to go now, she said. I'll be back in an hour, maybe an hour and a half. I'll come with you if you want me to, honey, he said. He was surprised at how easily the words came to him. It was as if some grace of husbands, wives, and desperate angels had helped him. Oh, don't bother, said the wife. It wouldn't be too much work for you. It would be too much work for you. Oh, well, it's up to you, he said. You really wouldn't mind, said his wife. Don't worry about it. I know you don't want to. She stood there, waiting for him to encourage her hopes. He strained his every effort to say the words again that would make her happy, but even as his mouth opened, he knew that he was going to fail. You, you heard what I said, he gasped out. Her face became resigned again. Never mind, she said. She turned out the light. Tears had begun to gush out of her eyes just as she reached for the switch, and it is possible that she had waited another three or four seconds, or, if he had somehow been able to make her do so, he would have seen them. She went down the stairs, opened the door, and left him. San Francisco, California Again he ascended the stairs between two gratings and tall black men made way for him on the landing because if he was white, he must be an undercover cop. Who you looking for, officer? One of them said. He said her name. You a cop? No. You a paid informant? No, officer, he said. The black man laughed, laughed grimly. He got to the top of the stairs where the second grating was, and the lobby man who had buzzed him was already standing on the other side of the grating with his arms folded. She not in here, the man said. She just now went outside to do her business, so I reckon she'll be back before long. He always said she wasn't there, and she was always there, so the John wasn't surprised. Can I uh, wait on your stairs, he said. Yeah, help yourself. He descended a stair or two to show his respect for the workings of the hotel, and waited, looking alertly through the grating like a zoo-barred jaguar waiting for meat, watching and waiting until just past midnight he saw her pass across the lobby on one of her constant errands. 
He was here to tell her how she made him feel. He called her name, and her face lit up. She became running to make the lobby man let him in. Thank you kindly, he said to the lobby man. The lobby man gazed expressionlessly away. At least he didn't charge the John five dollars to get in. I was just thinking about you, the prostitute said. I was afraid you'd quit me. Come on. She ran ahead of him up the back stairs to the toilet, and there was the man who laid out his or somebody else's possessions on the stairs, including pennies and nickels, and stood patiently waiting for them to make him rich. The prostitute had already run high into the smoky darkness above him as he picked his way past more loungers, and then he had caught up with her, and she had taken his hand. Soon now he could tell her, men like salt-encrusted pillars of cavern ebony walled them on both sides, looking silently as she kissed his lips and thrust her tongue repeatedly into his mouth. He wondered if he was tasting other men's semen. She slipped her arm around him and led him to the room where the two lesbian whores lived. The lesbian whores did very well in that hotel by renting out their room to strangers for five dollars for fifteen or twenty minutes. That was why they were so well frustrated. They had a so well furnished, not frustrated. They had a TV and even a single bed. The prostitute, who knew that the John would pay her back, gave the white horse some money, and the white horse slipped out. Inside the room, another white boy was sitting on the bed. He was smoking crack, and he was very nervous. Y'all make yourselves comfortable, and I'll re be, re be right back, the prostitute said, as prost prost prostitutes often say, and the John thought to himself, why not? What do I care if she doesn't show? I have all night, and I haven't even paid yet. The white boy offered him a piece of crack, rock, and the John thought again, why not? Because the prostitute was still there, and she was serving him so tenderly, holding the crack pipe to his mouth, lighting it, reminding him not to swallow the smoke, or he'd get nauseated, and then the feeling hit, the good feeling. And the prostitute grinned and went out. I, I don't like this, the other white boy said. I gave eighty dollars. Well, forty was just business, you know, but forty was to get me some more rock. Yeah, you'll see her again, the John said. You can trust her. Uh, usually I take it, her to my place and she stays the night, said the white boy. I don't like this place. This place is dangerous. The John could not tell what exactly the prostitute meant to this other person. He wanted to find out. He wanted very much to find out. How many times have you done her? he asked. Oh, two or three times, maybe four or five. Listen, he said to the other white boy. Can you do me a favor? When she comes back, I need to speak with her, just for five minutes. Then you could take her home. I won't get in your way. Oh, I don't want to do that, the white boy said. He was out, out of crack, and so his hand was clenched around the crack pipe, and his face was sweating. Okay, John said. They sat in silence on the bed, and then the black prostitute and the white prostitute came in to get toilet paper. Your friend sure is keeping you waiting, they said. That's rude. I'm going to talk to her, said the white boy. I need some rock. I gave her money. I need rock. Where's her room? Number 64, said the John. It's a real nice room. Lots of company sculling up and down the walls. The white boy went out, and the white whore sat down next to the John on the bed while her lover sat in the corner. The white whore, who had been going out with the black whore for eight years, was wearing a very low-cut dress that showed her rich, plump breast, and she bent towards him a little to make them move, and she said, You wanna, like, uh do anything? Just then somebody knocked on the door. The little black whore unlocked it, and the white boy came in. She said she'll be down in a minute, he said unhappily. So, the white whore was saying to the John, you think you might like a date? You're beautiful, he replied, but I've already got a date. Well, what if she don't come back? Oh, maybe then, I don't know, maybe then. 
Anybody, anybody got any rocks? said the white boy. She sure ain't showing you no respect, said the black whore. I don't like this, said the white boy. I'm getting very upset about this. What makes you attracted to her? the John asked. Oh, I don't even know her name exactly, the white boy yawned. It's just I run into her on the street sometimes. Just let me know if I'm in your way, said the John. Hey, no problem, dude. We can all hang out. Once you come back, you and me and these other girls, we can go to my place and party. You want a date? The white whore cut in, her eyes lighting up. I'm sorry my face is kind of a mess. I got into an accident. But if you want to date me, I'm real good. You see, the white boy said, I gave her eighty dollars. Eighty? laughed the black whore in the corner. You gave her eighty? <laughs> I'm getting, like, tense now, said the white boy. I'm afraid I might do something. I'll take care of it, the John said. He went upstairs to 64, and just as he as he was about to knock, the door across the hall opened, and an ancient Asian lady in a nightgown stuck her head out and flapped a moth-colored titty at him, and he bowed with his hand on his heart, at which she closed the door. Behind the other door, the prostitute he'd come for was saying, Just give me a dime bag just this once. I swear I'll never ask for more no favors. He knocked. Who is it? The prostitute shouted in her fiercest voice. It's me, said the John. I'm coming, I'm coming, she cried impatiently. I've got to go now, he called. I'll, I'll see you another time. That worked wonders. The prostitute practically flew out the door in her eagerness to keep him, and they went downstairs. These two girls are coming with us, the white boy said. Oh, no, they not, the prostitute cried. Ladies, I don't mean to disrespect you, but this is my business. We're going to go to his place and kind of get established, and then if we need you, we'll come and get you then. So I'll meet you at 2 a.m. at the corner, the white boy was whispering something to the white whore. Come on, the prostitute said. The two Johns got up and followed her into the lobby where the manager studied them within his glass cubicle, and the prostitute, who could tell by the taste whether the crack was good or not, opened the grating, and they went downstairs past the black man and through the second grating and onto the street. I wouldn't be doing this just for anybody, the prostitute said to the white boy, but you're such a dynamite guy. The prostitute ran across the street and bought the white boy. Where, where, and bought the white boy stood watching. I love two kinds of crack, he told her. The kind I smoke, and, well, you know, she laughed and laughed. Thanks for letting me come along to your house, he said to the white boy. I sure do appreciate that. Hey, no problem, dude. We'll chill out and party, you know. Just a couple of mellow crack beds. Everything okay, baby, the prostitute said to him. Soon we'll all be doing some really good rock. Danny here don't mind. He's quality. He really is. They got to the white boy's house, and the prostitute and the white boy were kissing. The John looked away. While the prostitute was in the bathroom, the white boy said, Come on into the bedroom for a minute. Why don't you sit down on the bed with me for a minute? You sure I'm not in your way, the John asked. You paid for her. I didn't. I can take off any time. Let you and me do her together, the white boy said, whispering. Uh, sure, John said. You go first. That's only fair. Besides, it's your place. No, 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 you don't get it. Let's do her together. Oh, I'm not exactly into that, said the John, watching to see if the white boy might suddenly scream in rage and pull out a knife or a gun. Uh, you know, I only do girls, he said. Oh, no, I'm not queer or anything, the white boy pleaded. There's nothing to it. We just turn on the lights, get under the covers, and you won't even know whose mouth it is. Well, I'll have to think that one over, John said, wondering if he would be able to knock the white boy down and run if the white boy turned out to be uh, covial with, an, uh, with the uh, white boy in the, in the newspaper who kept other boys' heads in his refrigerator. He decided that he could take the white boy easily. The white boy was very pale and puffy and unhealthy. If he had a gun, of course, that would be different. Please, the white boy said. 
If you don't do her with me, my whole evening will be ruined. The white boy was weeping, because he had broken so easily that John felt fairly sure now that he must not be dangerous. He put his hand on the white boy's shoulder and said, I just don't think I could do what you ask. I'm really sorry. How can I make it up to you? Oh, never mind, the white boy said. The prostitute was still in the bathroom. The white boy went and opened the door. Can't you see? I'm trying to poo, said the prostitute. I just wanted to give you this t-shirt, the white boy said, peering in eagerly. I thought you might like it. Thank you, the prostitute said. I appreciate that. You're a real dynamite guy. When she came out, the John said, Well, I have to go. What's wrong, baby? said the prostitute. Come on, smoke a little rock with us and relax. She took some of the white boy's crack and gave him a nice big hit. He felt the feeling again, the happy, excited feeling, and for a moment it was so strong that he couldn't talk. He exhaled through his nostrils, and his nose went numb. He could no longer feel the weight of his body, his body's sadness. Why don't you stay over, the white boy said. It's so late. You don't want to be out on the street. Uh, maybe I'll just take a stroll around the block, he said. He put his coat on, and the prostitute gave him another rock holding him tightly so that he could not get away. He's my baby, she said to the white boy, embracing the john desperately. He's the best. He's dynamite. I guess I'll go now, said the john. What's the matter, baby? said the prostitute. Listen, come on in the bedroom and tell me what's going on. Excuse us for a second, Danny. Sure, the white boy said dully. Now what's going on, said the prostitute sitting beside him on the bed with her hand on his knee, looking into his eyes like a worried mother whom he must not disappoint. He wants him and me to do you at the same time, he said, in a low voice because the bedroom door was open and he did not want to hurt the white boy's feelings. I just can't. I'm, I'm sorry. He said, that? cried the prostitute in amazement. I don't do that. It's okay, he said. Anyway, I'm going to go. She sat motionless on the bed. The white boy walked him to the door. He looked back, and she was sitting on the bed, crying. Please come here, she said. He went back to her, hesitated, and said, I love you. Then he strode out without looking back. The end. <laughs> okay, that was William T. Volman's story, the best way to smoke crack. Kind of a gritty story, uh, I'd say, of, of uh, the down and out life. Of a married man seeking thrills amongst the San Francisco prostitutes. Okay, we'll see what time it is. I don't think I have time for a Harlan Ellison story. I'm going to leave that for another time. Um, I'm going to go back and read some more poems by Jack Gilbert. I started off with Jack Gilbert, and we'll end with Jack Gilbert. Once again, a fine, great poet, Jack Gilbert. So we'll go back to his collection, The Great Fires. And this poem is called Finding Eurydice. Orpheus is too old for it now. His famous voice is gone, and his career is past. No prophet anymore from the songs of love and grief. Nobody listens. Still he goes on secretly with his ruined alto. But not for Eurydice. Not even for the pleasure of singing. He sings because that is what he does. He sings about two elderly Portuguese men in the hot Sacramento Delta country. How they show up every year or so, feeble and dressed, as well as their poverty allows. The husband is annoyed each time by their coming to see his seventy-year-old wife, who long ago when they were putting through the first railroads, was the most beautiful of all the horrors. Impatient, but saying nothing, 
He lets them take her carefully upstairs to give her a bath. He does not understand how much their doting eyes can see the sleek, gleaming beauty of her hidden in the bright water. And that poem was Finding Eurydice by Jack Gilbert from his collection The Great Fires published by Alfred Knopf in 1995. There's a short poem called Going There. Of course it was a disaster. The unbearable, dearest secret had always been a disaster. The danger when we try to leave, going over and over afterward what we should have done instead of what we did. But for those short times we seemed to be alive, misled, misused, lied to and cheated, certainly. Still, for that little while, we visited our possible life. The next poem is called Searching for Pittsburgh. Uh, Jock Gilbert was from, from Pittsburgh. He also wrote as uh, for Olympia Press as Tor Kung, a couple of uh, fine literary, I guess, erotic books. Uh, Tor Kung, which, and it, those books are all set in Pittsburgh. So, uh, Searching for Pittsburgh. The fox pushes softly, blindly, through me at night, between the liver and the sa and the stomach, comes to the heart and hesitates, considers and then goes around it, trying to escape the mildness of our violent world, goes deeper, searching for what remains of Pittsburgh in me. The rusting mills sprawl gigantically along their rivers, three rivers, the authority of them. The gritty alleys where we played every evening were stained pink by the inferno always surging in the sky, as though Christ and the Father were still fashioning the earth. Locomotives driving through the cold rain, lordly and bestial in their strength, massive water flowing morning and night throughout the city girded with ninety bridges. Sumptuous, shouldered, sleek thighed, obstinate and majestic, unquenchable, all grip and flood, mighty sucking and deep rooted grace, a city of brick and tired wood, ox and sovereign spirit, primitive Pittsburgh, winter month after month, telling of death, the beauty forcing us as much as harshness. Our spirits forged in the wilderness, our minds forged by the heart, making together a consequence of America. The fox watched me build my Pittsburgh again and again, in Paris afternoons, on Butte Chaumont, on Greek islands with their fields of stone, in beds with women, sometimes amid their gentleness. Now the fox will live in our ruined house. My tomatoes grow ripe among the weeds and the sound of water. In this happy place, my serious heart has made. The next poem is called Married. I came back from the funeral and crawled around the apartment, crying hard, searching for my wife's hair. For two months, got them from the drain, from the vacuum cleaner, under the refrigerator, and off the clothes in the closet. But after the Japanese women came, there was no way to be sure which were hers, and I stopped. A year later, repotting Michiko's avocado, I find a long black hair tangled in the dirt. The next poem is called Exclipating the Twilight. The rat makes her way up the mulberry tree, the branches getting thin and risky up close to the fruit, and she slows. The berry she is after is so ripe, there is almost no red. Prospero 
thinks of Christopher Smart, saying purple is black blooming. She lifts her mouth to the berry, stretching. The throat is an elegant gray, a thousand shades. Christopher wrote among the crazy people, a thousand colors from white to silver. It's a strange little poem. The next poem is called Steel Guitars. Once again, this is poems by Jack Gilbert from his book, The Great Fire. Steel Guitars. The world is announced by the smell of organo and sage. Let me restart that again. Steel Guitars. The world is surrounded by the smell of oregano and sage in rocky places high up with white doves higher still in the blue sky, or the faint voices of women and girls in the olive trees below, and a lustrous sea beneath that, like thoughts of lingerie while reading Paradise Lost in Alabama, or the boy in Pittsburgh that only summer he was nine, prowling near the rusty railroad yard where they put up vast tents, and a man lifted anvils, with chains through the, his nipples. The boy listened for the sound that made him shiver as he ran hard across the new sawdust to see the two women again on a platform above his head, indolent and almost naked in the simple daylight. Reality stretched thin as he watched their painted eyes brooding on what they contained. He vaguely understood that it was not their flesh that was a mystery, but something on the other side of it. Now the man remembering the boy knows there is a door. We go through and hear a sound like buildings burning, like the sound of a stone hitting a stone in the dark. The heart in its plenty, hammered by rain and need, by the weight of what momentarily is steel guitars next poem is called recovering amid the farms every morning the sad girl brings her three sheep and two lambs laggardly to the top of the valley past my stone hut and onto the mountain to graze she turned 12 last year and it was legal for her father to take her out of school she knows her life is over. The sadness makes her fine, makes me happy. Her old red sweater makes the whole valley ring, makes my solitude gleam. I watch from hiding for her sake. Knowing I am there is hard on her, but it is the force, the focus of her days. She always looks down and looks away as she passes in the evening, except sometimes when, just before going out of sight behind the distant cane break, she looks quietly back. It is too far for me to see, but there is a moment of white if she turns her face. The next poem is, let me see what time it is. The next poem is called, uh, The Spirit and the Soul. It should have been the family that lasted. Should have been my sister and my peasant mother. But it was not. They were the affection, not the journey. It could have been my father, but he died too soon. Gelmetti and Greg and Nagomi lasted. It was the newness of me, the newness after that, the newness again. It was the important love and the serious lust. It was Pittsburgh that lasted. The iron and fog and sooty brick houses. Not Aunt Mince and Pearl, but the black and white winters with their girth and geological length of cold. Streets ripped apart by ice and emerging like wounded beasts when the snow finally left in April. Freight trains with their steam locomotives working at night. Summers the sides of crusades. 
When I was a boy, I was downtown, a large camera standing in front of the William Pitt Hotel or pinned at Kaufman's department store, usually around midnight, but the people still going by. The camera set slow enough that cars and people left no trace. The crowds in Rome and Tokyo and Manhattan did not last, but the empty streets of Perugia, my two bowls of bean soup on costs, M. Peanut popcorn. Shana Kawapath lasted. The plain nakedness of Anna in Denmark remains in me forever. The wet lilacs on Highland Avenue when I was fourteen, carrying Michiko dead in my arms. It was not about the spirit. The spirit dances, comes and goes, but the soul is nailed to us like lentils and fatty bacon lodged under the ribs. What lasted is what the soul ate, the way a child knows the world, by putting it part by part into his mouth. As I tried to gnaw my way into the Lord, working to put my heart against that heart, lying in the wheat at night, letting the rain after all the dry months have me. This next poem is called To See If Something Comes Next. There is nothing here at the top of the valley. Sky and morning, silence and dry smell of heavy sunlight on the stone everywhere. Goats occasionally and the sound of roosters in the bright heat where he lives with the dead woman and purity, trying to see if something comes next, wondering whether he has stalled. Maybe he thinks it is like the no. Whenever the script says dances, whatever the actor does next is a dance. If he stands still, he is dancing. This next poem is called A Stubborn Ode. All of it. The same woman under the bed with the rat that is looking off that is licking off the peanut butter she puts on her front teeth for him. The beggars of Calcutta blinding their children while somewhere people are rich and eating with famous friends and having running water in their fine houses. Michiko is buried in Kamakura. The tired farmers thresh barley all day under the feet of donkeys amid the merciless power of the sun. The beautiful women grow old, our, ha our hearts moderate. All of us wane, knowing things could have been different. When Gordon was released from the madhouse, he could not find Hayden to say goodbye. As he left past Hall 8, he saw the face in the basement window, tears running down the, che the cheeks. And I say, nevertheless. Okay, so in this poem he mentions Gordon being released from the madhouse, which uh, is another reference to that one story of Gordon Lish I read called The Wire, where he talks about the psychiatrist who committed him to a madhouse. Uh, Gordon Lish was in the bug house for eight months, doing the bug house thing. Kind of the way that most of those MK Ultra Super Soldier types should all be in the bug house. Or have come from the bug house. Bug house in it. Alright, here's a poem called Ruins and Wobs. No, Ruins and Wabai. By Jack Gilbert. But to tell the truth, Storyville was brutal. The parlors of even the fancy whorehouses crawling with roaches and silverfish, the streets foul and the sex brawling. But in the shabby clapper buildings on Franklin and on Liberty and on Eberville was the invention. Throughout the district, you could hear Tony Jackson and King Oliver, Martin and Brecht finding it right night after night like the dream Belloc's photographs found in the midst of Egypt, 
Manatea and Mary Meat House, Aunt Cora and Gold Tooth Goosey. It takes a long time to get the ruins right. The Japanese think it's strange we paint our old wooden houses when it takes so long to find the wabi in them. They prefer the bonsai tree after the valiant blossoming is over, the leaves fallen, when bareness reveals a merit born to the vegetable struggling. Interesting that he makes references of uh, whorehouses with roaches and silverfish, as uh, that story with my William Volman, Best Way to Smell Crack, was about prostitute hotels and roaches. You see how all these things are connected. Let's find a good poem to finish with. Uh, well, I guess we could try ending with this. Trying to have something left over. That's the name of the poem. Trying to have something left over. Jack Gilbert from his collection, The Great Fires. There was a great tenderness to the sadness when I would go there. She knew how much I loved my wife and that we had no future. We were like casualties helping each other as we waited for the end. Now I wonder if we understood how happy those Danish afternoons were. Most of the time we did not talk. Often I took care of the baby while she did housework, changing him and making him laugh. I would say, Pittsburgh softly each time before throwing him up. Pittsburgh, whisper Pittsburgh with my mouth against the tiny ear and throw him higher. Pittsburgh and happiness high up, the only way to leave even the smallest trace so that all his life her son would feel gladness unaccountably when anyone spoke of the ruined city of steel in America, each time almost remembering something maybe important that got lost. Um, okay, one last poem here on stone. The monks petitioned to live the harder way in pits dug farther up the mountain but only the favored ones are permitted the scrapped life. The syrup water and cakes the abbot served me were far too sweet, a simple misunderstanding of pleasure because of inexperience. I put pull water up hand over hand from thirty feet of stone. My kerosene lamp burns a mineral light. The mind and its fierceness lives here in silence. I dream of women and hunger in my valley for what can be made of granite, like the sun hammering this earth into pomegranates and grapes, dryness giving way to the smell of basil at night. Otherwise, the stone feeds on stone, is reborn as rock, and the heart wanes. Athena's owl calling into the bareness and nothing answering. Relative pitch, Jack Gilbert. I was carrying supplies back up the mountain when I heard it. The laughter of children, so strange in this darkness, pushed past the brush and scrub willow and saw a ruined farmhouse and girls in ragged clothes. They had rigged a swing and were playing as though they were happy, as if they did not know any better. Having no way to measure, I thought, remembering the man in Virginia who found a ruined octagon, octagonal mansion and repaired it perfectly. For months he walked through the grand empty rooms wondering what they were like until he found a broken chair in the attic and recreated the colors and scale, discovered maybe the kind of life the house was. Strangers leave us poems to tell those they loved how they, their, the heart broke, to whisper of the religion upstairs in the dark, 
sometimes in the parlor amid blazing sunlight and under trees with rain coming down in august on the bare unaccustomed bodies well i guess uh, okay we'll finish with this one alone well maybe not we're at the end Okay, coming up next is, uh, I don't know, Reality Check or Midlife Crisis Radio with Nighthawk. This has been Worf Poe's Story Hour. When I uh, come back next week, we'll get back to science fiction and other stuff. This was just a literary moment in time. This is Worf Poe signing out. <laughs>